to our final video for Virgil's Aeneid, where we're going to cover books 9 through 12. Now, just to start with a heads up, those of you who have been going through the epic and watching these videos have probably noticed that, especially as I've, we've gone further on, I'm leaving out a lot of stuff. Now, on the one hand, that's a sign of how much of a classic, if you'll pardon the expression, Virgil's Aeneid really is. That we can cover so much and yet leave out so much. Um, there are so many different ways that one could approach studying Virgil's Aeneid. The ones that we're going to kind of focus on for the next year are questions of Virgil in history, in memory, which is one way that we're going to pair it up really nicely with what Caesar is doing. How Virgil makes use of the previous Greek literary tradition. Right now we're going to look at Virgil and Homer, that's the big one. But then there's also Virgil in a period called Hellenistic poetry in terms of its chronology, and we sometimes call it Alexandrian poetry in terms of its geography, that it's centered around the city of Alexandria in Egypt. Uh, Callimachus is the major figure here, and we'll talk more about him. And the last one is uh, Virgil in politics, which I'm going to try to focus for us next year, and I've mentioned this before, as Virgil in tragedy. Uh, we mostly know it famously as Greek tragedy, mostly because none of the Roman ones have really survived. But some of the things that tragedy is trying to do in terms of pitting various points of view and perspectives against one another without a clear answer, which is the whole problem of the Antigone, that play I keep mentioning, but is true of many um, Greek tragedies. The Oresteia, another influential one. The end of the Oresteia has the tragic question, okay, this guy Orestes, he killed his mother. That's bad. But why did he kill his mother? To get justice for his father, whom his mother killed. So what do you do with Orestes? And this is a problem that Aeschylus, for example, res uh, wrestles with. And we'll hear a lot about Orestes in the, Aenea, uh, in the Odyssey, rather. One of the kind of underlying themes beginning in the Odyssey could be summed up uh, best by my friend Jimmy D'Amico uh, as, Hey, did you hear what happened to Agamemnon? His wife killed him! And that's always a model for Telemachus. Um, wives we don't worry much about in the Aeneid. Uh, Dido tries to be Aeneas' wife. It uh, doesn't work out for her. Creusa doesn't make it past the second book. Lavinia, don't even know what's going on there. She doesn't even want to marry him. She wants to marry Turnus. Being Aeneas' wife is like being the drummer for Spinal Tap. Ask your parents. So we're going to leave a lot out of our discussion of books 9 through 12. A lot of it we're going to cover next year in more detail because reading some of it in Latin. But um, we're going to try to cover all four books and just hit a couple of big points on these lectures and we'll explore the rest together over the next year or so. So, the war has begun. Aeneas has new armor and a shield. He is returning to the battlefield leading these Arcadians and Etruscans against their king Mezentius. But when we get back to book nine, Aeneas isn't back yet. And so we have, in Book 9, the night mission of Nisus and Euryalus. Remember them from Book 5. And this is modeled after an episode in Book 10 of Homer's Iliad called the Dolonea, the night raid of Odysseus and Diomedes. In Book 10, you'll have Pallas, the son of Evander, Aeneas' new ally, and sort of Aeneas's protege. He sort of fulfills the Patroclus role. Uh, that Achilles' friend Patroclus does in the Iliad. And how he is killed by the evil uh, Etruscan king who was kicked out by his people, Mezentius. And we'll see in Book 10 a real arc in Mezentius' character. We've heard in Book 8 how terrible this guy is, but that's not quite how he's portrayed in Book 10, and a lot of it hinges on the death of his own son. And <clears throat> we can... One area you could investigate that we won't really too much today is how Virgil portrays um, the death of the, of the glamorous youth, like Pallas or like Mezentius' son, who has an interesting role uh, to play with his killer, Aeneas. After all, 
from his entrance's son, it is his very pietas that makes him jump in front of Aeneas' spear to save his father. This horrifies Aeneas for obvious reasons. In Book 11, you have the great figure of the sort of Italian Amazon Camilla, uh, who has her great Aristea or moment of glory in Book 11, and then her own death. And then finally in Book 12, the conf final confrontation between Aeneas and Turnus. So we're going to spend a lot of time talking about the end of Book 12 in two different languages. So let's start with Nisus and Euryalus, this pair of lovers that we encountered in Book 5 in the foot race. So, we're in the Trojan camp. Aeneas isn't back yet. Nisus and Euryalus come up with a plan to spy on and maybe kill a few of the Italians that they are fighting against. So they plan a night raid. There is great slaughter. This is it, Euryalus. Cover our rear and keep your eyes open. I'll lead on. I'll make a broad of blood that you can't miss. This is Nisus talking. Then he closed his mouth and addressed Ramnes with his sword. This proud man, propped on a pile of blankets and snoring loudly, was a king himself and served King Turnus well, as his augur. But he could not augur his way out of death. Nisus killed his three attendants first, and Remus his armor-bearer. That's an interesting name. A lot of these names are interesting that Virgil gives for these various Italian warriors, many of whom are just on the page to die. Some of them have Egyptian names, too, which is really weird. <clears throat> and the charioteer, finding him at his horse's feet, and then severed the horse's drooping necks. Well, that's unnecessary. What is this, the godfather? Then he decapitated Ramnes himself and left the trunk spurting blood. The couch and the ground were soaked with warm black gore. Nisus killed also Lamiris, Lamas, and the young Seranus, a handsome boy who had played late that night, but was mastered by sleep, happy, if only he had played his game until dawn. So, that's pretty grim. A lot of, a lot of grim death here in this part of the Aeneid. And then they decide to take a spoil of war, a gleaming helmet, which directly contributes to their death. And then after they've been killed by the Italians, their heads thrown back into the camp to the horror of Euryalus' mother, the narrator offers this comment. In Latin, Fortunati ambo, si quid mea carmina possunt, nulla diesum quam memori vos eximedaevo, Dum domus eniae capitoli immobili saxum, a colet imperiumque pater romanus habebit. Happy pair, if my poetry has any power, never shall you be blotted from memory, as long as the house of Aeneas still stands on the capital's unmoving rock, and the Roman father rules supreme. Nulla dies umquam memori vos eximetaevo. Never shall you be blotted from memory. Let's focus on that line for a moment. Another way to translate it would be, no day will ever abolish you from unforgetting time. Now, in the following slide, I'm going to include a picture of one of the elements of the current monument to the destruction of the World Trade Center on September 11, 2001. This element uses the quotation from the passage, the alternative translation concerning the deaths of Nisus and Euryalus discussed above. So here's the monument. No day shall erase you from the memory of time. Virgil. Misspelled. With an E. With an E. This is, if I'm ever Secretary of Education, you're going to have all these monuments redone, all these textbooks redone in America. Why? Well, Dr. Wright insists it's Virgil with an E. So... <clears throat> Many critics expressed discomfort at the use of this specific quotation in the context of the memorial to the dead at the World Trade Center attack. So let's think through why some people might have a problem with it. We might separate this into two groups. The people who put the memorial up, who have not read the Aeneid, and the people who were like, hey, wait a second, who had? What do I mean? Well, the original context doesn't fit the new context. 
he was talking, Virgil's talking about these two men attacking this camp, striking terror into it, who are then killed. The memorial here is to the victims. You would think that the quote would be about, say, Romnes and Remus and all these other people that Nisus and Urialis killed. So another way to put it is if we're thinking of the original context of the quote, then the quote in the memorial is not referring to the victims. It's referring to Muhammad Atta and the others who took the planes. That's a problem. So some people might say, well, the original context doesn't really matter. It's the sentiment that counts. So you're taking a radical, just tearing away of the poetry um, to it. Why cite Virgil then? Happy pair, if my poetry has any power, never shall you be blotted from memory. As long as the house of Aeneas still stands and the capital's unmoving rock and the Roman father rules supreme. <clears throat> well, in that temporal boundary of that context, you might argue, well, we're still reading the Aeneid. We're still, you know, cultural heirs to the Roman Empire. But all of these things don't exist anymore. So by Virgil's own, th own thinking, then, these people would be forgotten. But it still ties it to such an explicitly Roman context. Founder Aeneas center of the city, the capital, Roman father, Jupiter, head of the Roman religion. So that doesn't really fit what we're trying to do in New York City. And then think about the violence that occurred. So again, if the sentiment isn't all that important, then why would you cite Virgil at all? Just because it sounded cool? But, and many people have studied this, notably uh, the great Harvard Virgilian Richard Thomas, the use or misuse of historical models is of major importance to Virgil himself and also to the reception of Virgil's text by others in the Middle Ages, in the modern period, and so forth. One way to think about what are we doing with historical models is to think through the shield of Aeneas and the different elements we had there that we talked about in class or the Parade of Heroes in Book 6, and similarly how we talked about that in class. So Virgil would find this reuse or misuse to be curious. But, <clears throat> again, I think it does separate. If you've read the Aeneid and you know what context that comes from, this particular use, I think, would make you uh, kind of uncomfortable. Because if we tie it to our context, even without the way it's situated in Roman time, uh, you know, this is, it turns it into a memorial to the 9-11 hijackers. So maybe Mohammed bin Salman uh, can furnish the upkeep for that. If you don't get that particular reference, uh, just remember there are 20 pages of the 9-11 report that uh, don't officially exist. It's all about Saudi Arabia. 15 of the 19 hijackers. So, let's move on to Book 10. So, I've chosen a number of passages from Virgil's 10th book of the Aeneid. What do all of these passages have in common? Number one. Aeneas attacked first, charging the Latin ranks, field hands and raw recruits. He ran them over, an omen of what was to come, killing Theron, who more than other men itched to face the hero. Lycus was next, cut from his dead mother's womb as a child, he was consecrated to you, Phoebus. Why did you let him escape steel as a baby, but not now? And you too, Larides and Timber, twin sons of Daucus, fell in the Rutilian plain. As boys, you were indistinguishable from each other, a sweet perplexity to your parents. But Pallas made you easy to tell apart, lopping off your head, Timber, with a Vander's sword. Here's quotation two. Number three. Halysis countered them. Collecting himself behind his shield, this bold warrior brought down Lydon, Pheres, and Demodocus, sliced off Stramonius' hand with bright steel, and smashed in Thoas's face with stone, scrambling the bones with blood and brains. Helysus' father, prophesying his fate, had hidden the boy in the woods, 
Later, when his hollow ancient eyes closed in death, the fate laid their hands on Halysis and marked him out for Arcadian spears. Quote four. Liger, a picture of misery with outstretched hands, but the Trojan hero that you are, and by the parents who bore such a son, spare this life and have pity on a suppliant. He had more to say, but Aeneas, that's not what you said before. Now die with your brother. And Aeneas' sword laid bare Liger's soul. So, the previous set of slides have chosen a couple of passages, four, from the tenth book of the Aeneid. What do they have in common? Well, very few of the soldiers who are killed are left nameless. And this is true in Homer's Iliad as well. Everybody gets a little kind of story. It's just like, oh, he was the son of so-and-so. And that's often the easiest way the poet, whether it's Virgil or Homer, can characterize these soldiers via genealogy. Who their father is, maybe sometimes who their mother is, or brothers, and things like that. Their heroic achievement, well, is dying on another hero's sword. And this all culminates in Aeneid 10 with the death of Pallas. So you've got Pallas, king of Vander's son, who's killed by Turnus. Mesentius, an Etruscan king who's allied with Turnus. And Lausus, Mesentius' son. So I've been mentioning this confrontation between Aeneas and Lausus before, so let's talk about it. Aeneas, you're headed for death, Lausus. Why rush it by daring what's beyond your strength? Your filial devotion is blinding you. But Lausus was much too wound up to think, and now the Dardanian leader's rage was mounting higher, and the fates gathered up the last threads of Lausus's life. Aeneas drove his sword straight through the young body he faced and up to the hilt, the point piercing his shield, far too fragile to counter this threat, and the tunic his mother had woven of soft golden threads. Blood filled his chest, his soul left his body, and sighed through the air to the shades below. When Aeneas's son looked on his dying face, so strangely pale, he groaned in pity and stretched out his hand. There shone in that face the image of his own devotion to Anchises. This is an important scene because it starts to give us a split between the pious Aeneas that we're used to for good and ill, devoted to his father, so devoted to his people that he abandons Dido. And the reverse of that, his furor, his wrath on the battlefield, where Virgil eventually will... Uh, in a simile, describe him like a vicious titan. We saw a flash of that wrath, remember, in Book 2, when, ignoring Hector, Aeneas goes to fight and die in Troy, until his mother tells him otherwise. The context here, though, is what we would call a proleptic civil war. Proleptic in that it's looking forward in terms of a civil war, because eventually these are all going to be one people, the Romans. And eventually, the Latins are already Italians. They will be merged with the Trojans, and they will all be called Latins. So ethnicity is all mixed up here, like in civil war. And then each side has something to claim for right on its side. The Trojans need a new home, one that's fated to them by the gods. But think for, on the Italian side for a second. You have a bunch of colonizers. You have a bunch of just invading forces. How would you feel if a bunch of people just showed up in Barnstable, said that God said this was our new homeland, and then spent time chasing you all, chasing you all out of your homes and your cities in Sturgis? That's what the Italians are facing. Their turn is focuses it on the... Um, uh, broken marriage with Lavinia, and yes, Virg, uh, Electo and Juno have inspired fury in Amata and Turnus, but they didn't take the time to do that with every single Italian soldier. So here, Virgil's reminding us that there can be pietas on both sides. Lausus is always portrayed as a great person who happens to have a shitty father, Mesentius. But 
this moment where Aeneas recognizes the Pietas on the other side, how that's a reflection of him in what he has tried to show to Anchises. It's that famous line, we have seen the enemy and they is us. So the deaths in Virgil's Aeneid 10 are carefully described to remind us just who was dying. Young soldiers, sons, even daughters, Camilla, brothers, family members. The piety that so characterizes Aeneas, remember that image that he carries his own father out of the ruins of Troy, is challenged by the loss of his charge, Pallas, and the needless horror of war, and unrelenting fate. We're back at Hegel's slaughter bench of history. Okay, we're going to move on, going to largely just skip book 11 for now, and move on to the end in book 12. A truce attempts to solve the battle modeled on the truce in duel between uh, Paris and Menelaus in Iliad 3. So you have Aeneas and Turnus fight it out for Lavinia in the war, just as they fought it out for Helen in the war. Uh, Juno, uh, not a fan of this, and so a random... Trojan, or or maybe even Juno herself, Jupiter certainly suspects it so, uh, harms Aeneas, breaking the truce, and so he must be healed by this doctor and Venus here uh, before returning to battle. But now, we're at a point in Book 12 where Virgil doesn't even take the time to narrate all the dead. The dead become nameless. We see this too... Um, when Patroclus, in Book 16 of the Iliad, inspired by Athena, just starts going through um, waves after waves of Trojans. When Turnus saw Aeneas withdraw in his captains a disarray, he burned with new hope. He called for his horses and arms, bounded into his chariot, and proudly took the reins in his hands. The chariot ride brought death to many. Many he rolled over half alive, crushing entire platoons under hooves and wheels, and picking off those who tried to escape with spear after spear. What god could now unfold for me so many bitter deaths? Which poet could tell of all the captains who met their many dooms, driven over the plain now by Turnus, now by the Trojan hero? Did it please you, Jupiter, that nations destined to live in everlasting peace should clash so harshly? There's that proleptic civil war imagery again. Pious Aeneas, on the other hand, Aeneas was hungry for, for the fight. Impatient of any delay, he clasped golden greaves on to his shins and started handling a spear. As soon as his breastplate was strapped on and his shield was fitted to his side, he put his arms around Ascanius, kissed him lightly through his helmet, and said, Learn how to be a good man from me, my son. Learn good fortune from others. Today my hand will defend you in war and lead you to great rewards. When you come of age, see to it that you remember the example of your kinsmen, and your father Aeneas, and your, un and your uncle Hector enliven your soul. This is sort of the ideology, the origin of Roman exemplarity, where Romans look up to other family members and ancestors, or even just other great Romans, as the examples for how to act and be good Romans. This is part of aristocratic competition, too. Uh, this is how Polybius describes the Roman funerals, uh, where you have these images of great Romans in your family meant to inspire you to greatness. That's what Aeneas is doing here with Ascanius, who had his little tiny Aristea where, you know, he shot a shot and killed a guy, and Apollo comes down and congratulates him, and then says, okay, stay out of the rest of the war. And so, we get to our final conflict, Turnus and Aeneas. So let's take a look at some of Turnus' last actions. Turnus, shaking his head, you don't scare me, big mouth. The gods scare me, and having Jupiter as my enemy. Turnus said no more. Looking around, he saw a huge stone lying on the plain, a stone ancient and huge, set in place to settle boundary disputes. Twelve chosen men could scarcely lift it onto their shoulders, as men are now. But the hero scooped it up quickly, rose to his full height, and with a burst of speed hurled it at his adversary. But as he ran, he did not know himself. He did not know who he was, and he moved towards the immense stone, lifted it, and sent it flying. But his knees buckled. His blood was like ice. The stone itself, <clears throat> rolling through the empty air, fell short and did not deliver its blow. And here's the simile. In dreams, 
When night's weariness weighs on our eyes, we are desperate to run farther and farther, but collapse weakly in the middle of our efforts. Our tongues don't work, our usual strength falls, our body, fails our body, and words will not come. So too turn us. So we return to the imagery of shadow, night's weariness weighs on our eyes, and dreams, and uncertainty. And notice the placement of the scene right before Turnus's death. So, <clears throat> Turnus's final words after he's been defeated by Aeneas. Go ahead, use your chance. I deserve it. I will not ask anything from myself, but if a parent's grief can still touch you, remember your father in Chises, and take pity on Donus's old age, I beg you. Give me, or if you prefer, give my dead body back to my people. Aeneas stood there lethal in his bronze. So this is meant to remind us of Iliad 24, where Priam comes and begs Achilles successfully for the body of Hector. But Aeneas' eyes searched the distance, and his hand paused at the hilt of his sword. Turnus's words were winning him over. Now, it's important to note here, this is a unique scene in ancient epic. Heroes don't hesitate like this. It, as much as what happens next is disturbing, the fact that <clears throat> Aeneas hesitated at all is unique and epic. But then his gaze shifted to the fateful, fateful baldric on his enemy's shoulder, and the belt glittered with its familiar metalwork, the belt of young Pallas, whom Turnus had killed and whose insignia he now wore as a trophy. Aeneas' eyes drank in this memorial of his own savage grief, and then burning with fury and terrible in his wrath, he said, Do you think you can get away from me while wearing the spoils of one of my men? Pallas sacrifices you with this stroke. Pallas, and makes you pay with your guilty blood. Saying this, and seething with rage, Aeneas buried his sword in Turnus's chest. The man's limbs went limp and cold, and with a moan his soul fled resentfully down to the shades below. Now, uh, one quick note, I know we didn't cover Book 11, but th the way that Turnus dies here with his soul fled resentfully down through the shades, it repeats how Camilla dies, where her soul fled resentfully down to the shades at the end of Book 11. So, before we look at those three things, a couple of points here. Uh, my old teacher, Will Batstone, once made the point that Aeneas is so enraged here, seething with rage, that he has a moment of psychological displacement, assigning the agency of what he's about to do to Pallas. He is also making Turnus into a kind of foundational sacrifice, which is an image we'll talk about a lot over the next year. But also, at the end of the epic, Aeneas gives in to furor and rage. Or put another way, the force that he had been set up as pious Aeneas and Pietas to oppose, the furor of Juno, that is what overtakes him at the end of the epic. Does this mean that Juno wins? That's an open question that's worth considering when I make you write a paper about the end of the Aeneid. But a modern analogy might help here. Does the Joker win at the end of the Dark Knight? Almost, because he had his ace up his sleeve, Harvey Dent, whom he turns into Two-Face, driving him insane. And the only way that Gordon and Batman can keep this quiet and still keep the city together is to lie about it and to displace all the guilt onto Batman. Now, eventually, we see in the following movie that this like a blue fails because Tom Hardy finds, you know, this special note. Oh, Commissioner Gordon! I see, it was Harvey Dent who really did this. Um, but you have that there where these forces of anarchy and chaos uh, can barely be restrained. And when you add on the next movie, The Dark Knight Rises... Were they really successfully restrained? The city still breaks down into, into chaos eventually. So, 
Final analysis. We have an alignment for the first time of Aeneas's goals. Private, avenging Pallas, and public, defending his people. His last action is associated with sacrifice. He says that pretty explicitly. Pallas sacrifices you with this stroke. And here we might think of um, the theories of René Girard, um, although it's been adopted uh, by some really terrible people, like literal vampire Peter Thiel, that uh, Girard's ideas, and I'm grossly simplifying them here, have to do with the power of sacred violence as a foundational act. One way is trying to explain why is it that sacrifice is so central to ancient religions, um, Zoroastrianism, Greco-Roman religion, even ancient Judaism up until 70 uh, CE. Sacrifice isn't wiped out in the ancient world until Theodosius II at the end of the 4th century. And then his last action, characterized by rage and furor. So, yeah, who does win? And that's why it's an epic that's worth thinking about. Um, one other thing to remember, who or what is it that sits at the side of Jupiter's throne at the end of Book 12 that he sends to scare Juturna away from saving Turnus? It's a fury. Jupiter's had his own fury all along. And so these categories of pietas in order from Jupiter in furor in Juno collapse at the end. And what we are left with, well, I don't know what we're left with. I've been wrestling with this for a while. We're going to wrestle with it for the rest of uh, our time together over the next year. But it's one of the things that make this such a great poem, is this, quite frankly, disturbing ending. Some people in the Middle Ages weren't satisfied with it and wrote, you know, a need book 13. And added to that, uh, at least some of them gave Lavinia an actual speaking role, believe it or not. So as I've said, we've left out so much, not least of which is Book 11. And we will talk so much more about these last books and the imagery in them over the next year. But I hope that I've at least highlighted some of the big points for them, uh, in them for you. And we'll turn to uh, some lighter reading to close out the year with Homer's Odyssey. And you'll see, because I've mentioned it so many times, there's going to be a lot in there that will help illuminate what's going on uh, in the Aeneid and what Virgil owes to Homer. Okay, we'll see you guys soon.